So my name is Casper and I'm a composer and I've been uh, working for a number of years uh, doing workshops especially for kids. I've been doing many workshops I think maybe around six or seven hundred kids have been through my machine. Which age? Uh, I like working with uh, 10 to 12 year olds because they are still kids but they are, I think they are adults. So you can get them to play very much if you push the right button. And uh, uh, ones. what? So I work with uh, smartphones. I work with uh, digital media, media. I work with narratives and these kinds of things in order to make kids um, start playing with sound as a means of expression. So lately I've been thinking, uh, I, I, I'm very much engaged within uh, sustainable things on the side. I've been starting a, a repair cafe on Vestable. Yeah, so I've been starting these, I've been working on these two lines, you know, about uh, working with sound as a means of expression. And on the side I've also, I'm very much engaged in how to make, change the world into a place where we are more sustainable. So. Um, and what I'm doing now is combining the two. Okay. So uh, we're going to do a workshop in uh, I think 10 minutes, a quarter of an hour. And at that moment, I would like to invite you to stand up and uh, start doing some movements and making sounds with your voices. So you can mentally start preparing for that. It can be a tough thing because adults tend to be very much like they want to talk and discuss and sit on their butts, but we're going to stand up and actually do some movements and sounds. Okay? And I promise that it's not going to be challenging. You're going to feel comfortable. And if you should not feel comfortable, you can always just step aside and just watch the rest. Okay? So, uh, my concept... Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yes. My concept, I call it building sound collectives. And of course it has two meanings. Right? At the same time, it's about building healthy collectives and it's also about building collectives through sound. I would like to ask if uh, culture could be considered the fourth pillar of sustainability. Because this is a model from the Danish government. It talks about economical and social, and they call it green sustainability. But I'd like to ask if culture is not to be regarded as a fourth pillar of sustainability. So this is a very common model throughout the world. Um, I think that many governments use this model. In a Danish policy context, culture in general is something that we talk about when it comes to leisure time activities in general public schooling and cultural institutions like museums and uh, theaters and these kinds of things. So the only connection that seems to be between a cultural dimension and these dimensions when it comes to policy making is when you talk about culture in terms of economy. In this case culture is understood as, uh, as cultural products, products of goods that can be sold and exported so politicians like to talk about culture in the terms of an export thing. When I do this workshop, when we're going to do this workshop, my, I'm basing it on seven assumptions. First of all, yes, cultural sustainability is indeed a fundament for the other sustainabilities. This is my assumption. If we want to make the changes in the other uh, domains, we, mean, we need to make social, uh, cultural uh, changes first because we need to embed the changes as cultural patterns in our collectives. Second, the reason why uh, culture is an important factor is that culture is durable. It lasts for a long time. It's difficult to make changes in culture. So when we embed things in our cultural patterns, it takes time to change them. And this is why it's also important that we have collectives that are actually good at working in the culture. And the third one, culture is a collective phenomenon. That might seem obvious, but when we're looking at the political and mainstream discourses around culture, 
it isn't obvious. In these discourses, culture is something that is a relation between an individual, that is the audience, and uh, cultural products. When we understand uh, culture as the consumption of cultural goods, the relation established is a relation between an individual, an anonymized consumer, and an expert producer, which is the artist. Or So when we have collectives, they are based on something, right? We are collecting around something. And I say that this, what we are collecting around is activities that we have in common. And I divide these activities into four levels. The first level has to do with producing and consuming. So we are producing together, and we're doing this at the workplace in our time. Or we are consuming together, and we are going shopping with our best friends. We are having Christmas together. We are eating a lot of herrings and, schnapp and drinking schnapps at Christmas times. And we have uh, smoking pots or whatever. People have collectives around consumption. But I don't think this is enough when we talk about people. So I think there is a second level which is about playing. So when we are doing sports together, or we are dancing, all the things that are going on in our lives that has to do with production and consumption, I would call this playing. My belief is that a collective that has as many of these parts as possible is a stronger collective. Traditionally, we used to do these things in the same place, right? That was embedded in the family or the local village. Now we seem to divide these activities into different groups, right? So there is also a level of somehow storing the cultural patterns that we are using in these other levels. So we, we embed our cultural patterns in the way we use our bodies, like I'm doing this now, it's a gesture. I don't know where it comes from. I probably have seen somebody else doing it, but I'm not aware. But we are storing our patterns in the body and also in our voices. The way that we use our voices is very culturally um, uh, influenced. And we're also storing, of course, in the way that most people understand storing in text. Right? We're writing text, we're writing books. I would say that the level of the body and the voice is actually a much more efficient way to store things. It, it lasts for longer. I, t I tend to forget about text. Right? And if you look at your Facebook stream, it's always new. You don't, you don't remember what's going on. Right? Always, all the time, it's new, 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 new. But the body is, is, is um, keeping things simple. And this is why it's more efficient. There's a fourth level which I would call composing. This is the level where we're trying to, to do these things differently. This is the level where we are um, taking elements of all the other levels and we are mixing them around, doing something differently. And uh, this is what we're going to try today. We're going to compose the collective. We're trying to take out patterns and see what happens to them if we mix them differently. A fifth assumption is that cultures are constantly, our collectives are constantly composing themselves. We are constantly changing the way we are doing things by ourselves. We don't need people to tell us because all the time we are creating culture. If you put two people together in a room, they will start building culture. Right? They, are not, they don't need someone, to, an expert, to tell them how to behave, what to do, because we are all the time building culture. This is what I see in kids. And, and when they are playing, they are like all the time building culture. But what happens? There are not, no structures to, to grab it. What they are doing is, is, is lost in the moment because they are not in a context. This is my belief, where they can actually build culture and, and store it because it's done in the moment and then it's forgotten. Okay? In order to make sustainable changes, we need to take this into consideration. And, um, if, if we have new situations facing our collectives, right? Which is the question we have now with change, changes in climate, changes in the economy, uh, changes in the, in the social area. These changes will affect our collectives. So what happens if our collectives are just changing right away? Right? If we take what we had and throw it off, throw it away, 
and we just take in the new without safeguarding anything from what we have, we're going to be uh, wiped out as a culture. So we're going to be lost, we're going to be put into small boxes where we are individuals. Right? So the collective needs to have some stamina, it has to have some resistance to changes. When we are composing our collectives, we are using all forms of human interaction. Right? The most common way we are thinking about the way that we as adults, because I'm talking to you as adults, not as kids, <laughs> if you should have thought something else, is that we are usually using text. We are usually talking. Right? But many things are going on at the level of our bodies and our, of our voices that we don't consider. I would like to give you a short example, an anecdote. In Sweden, when they are the, the social workers who are dealing with people with a handicap, they call them people with a handicap, something like that. In Denmark, they say handicap. So even, I read an article about it a year ago, in a Danish home for people with disabilities, the social worker might go into the room and say, so hi, you spastic, how are you doing? And, and this is really offensive to us in the Swedish context. They will go like, you can't do that. I mean, you have to punish that person or something like that. You have to put them into prison. Well, so one zero to Sweden in this case. Right? They are good at using language the right way, the politically correct way. So they say things the right way. On the other hand, uh, there's a question which is very debatable. We're not going to debate this till now. But do uh, people with a handicap have the right to have a sexual life, for example? In Denmark they say yes. So the social worker will provide the handicapped per uh, person with a uh, sex worker, a prostitute. And in Sweden they say no, 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 you can't do that. So I would say 1-0 to Denmark in this case because I mean, this is saying, even though they say, hi, Spastic, how are you doing? And they are doing it probably in a totally, I mean, making fun. But the person is probably okay with it, because they're respecting them as a person with a body as well. So I would say, at one level we have language, which is about putting names on things, which is like we use the correct words when talking about people with minority background or whatever. On the other hand, if we don't treat them as human beings with their bodies as well, we're missing something. You, you get my point? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, when we are composing our collectives, we need to take into account the body and the voice and language, of course. Why are sound and gesture a good means to work with building collectives? I would say that um, when we're using words, we can easily cheat, right? We can, we can write a wrong word in a text and nobody will know what we are feeling, right? But sound and gesture is linked with our emotions. So when we express ourselves through the way we move and our, our voices, we can't lie. We're actually saying exactly what we're feeling. It's much more difficult to tell a lie with your body and your voice. And building a sound collective is very much about starting by building trust. If you don't trust people, you can't build a collective. <coughs> this is one book by Bruno Latour. He's a French uh, anthropologist and philosopher. And, and he has written this book called Reassembling the Social. And when I'm reading philosophers, etc., I'm trying to find someone who talks about the collective. But everyone is talking about the individual. So how can we know how to live as a collective when our science, psychology, and all the other branches, they are focusing on the individual. Right? So, living as a collective, we are sort of, we have very few uh, ways of getting smarter. But this guy is, is actually talking about the collective. And he breaks up the, the division between uh, micro level, which is like the individual, and macro level, which is society. Right? When we read articles, it's always about about culture, for example, it's always about how do people react in society. So we have these two levels that are incompatible. It's too far away. I'm just a small individual. Society is very big. But we have collectives, which is an, a, an intermediate 
place. Right? So this guy's talking about that. And there's another book by the same guy called Politics of Nature, which is relevant when it comes to sustainability. How do we see nature? And he actually says that our view of nature is a culturally uh, defined view. And it's an interesting book. Um, and this guy is, is also French. His name is Henri Lefebvre. And he, uh, he has written a lot of books about urbanity and, and time and space and these kinds of things. And this book is a very small book called Rhythm Analysis. It's a book about how there are rhythms in everything and how these rhythms influence each other. And some rhythms are healthy, some rhythms are unhealthy. And we're actually going to work with rhythms. We're going to start by asking, finding our heartbeat, which is like a very important rhythm, which is uh, influenced by other rhythms in our surroundings and also are, we are influencing each other. If I'm nervous, I start influencing you. You get nervous, right? But if I'm calm, which I suppose I know, you might not get nervous on my behalf. Um, the last book is about, uh, it's, it's a guy called John Hawkes. He's an Australian uh, researcher and activist, it says. And he has written this book called The Fourth Pillar of Sustainability.